Okay, g'day, I'm Aiden. I'm here to run you through a quick demonstration of how to assemble one of the cycloidal gearboxes on the arm. So this gearbox is more, almost entirely designed and fabricated from within the uni. Some of the parts were made by, by us, some were part made by the Mechan staff, and they're all built around the Maxon motor. So this is a motor plus planetary gearbox, and we're going into this cycloidal gearbox for the final stage of reduction. So what we're going to start with is, first of all, there are three separate gearboxes on this arm, um, on the main joints at least, using this exact design. The first three are the base rotation on the bottom and the shoulder on top. This assembly has already been done beforehand and each of these gearboxes is identical so if you're ever reassembling any of these gearboxes you need to, you need to follow the exact same procedure for any of these three. The only thing that changes slightly is these, the shape of these interface blocks. So on these ones they've got L-shaped ones and on this one you've got um, like clip ones instead. They essentially bolt to the same uh, gear housing the same way and do the same thing. That's really the only difference. Cool. So what we're going to start with is this gear housing plus these. I've already Loctited in these M4 countersunk bolts. You need to make sure that everything is flush with the surface of the bottom of this gear housing. These uh, bearings do protrude by just a very small amount if you can feel it, but that's okay. What we're going to do first is chuck in one of our axial thrust bearings. So these thrust bearings are made up of two racers on top and bottom. They're essentially thin steel washers and the main cage full of needle bearings in the center. So a needle sandwich, chuck it into the gear housing like that. That should slide nicely. If it doesn't, then you might want to try the different, the different one. Uh, in fact, at this point, you might as well test the fit on all of these. Just because these bearings are a little bit cheap, some of them don't have the same diameters. So just make sure that you fit them perfectly so that they can both rotate in their housings. So one in the gear housing and one in the cycloidal ring. They're both fitting nicely. Take that one out for now. Okay, next up we're going to be installing the central bore, the sun gear, and the spacer. So this assembly goes like th thus. And then inserts through the ball like this. Before I do that, just make sure that you've installed the sun gear in the correct orientation. This little step on the gear housing needs to push this bearing into the gear into the sun gear. Otherwise you're at risk of pushing the bearing out when it's assembled and operating. So make sure that it slides on that way. Followed by the spacer underneath. Once that's pushed through the gear housing, this is fallen out. I'm gonna go and grab a pair of circlet pliers and a 30 millimeter circlet. And engage your safety squints when you put on the circlet on the back and just make sure it's properly seated in the circlet groove. go. So you need to make sure that, that is completely housed within the um, circlip groove. Now this is not particularly tight, that is really just for assembly. Um, once we assemble everything it's all locked in place. Okay, next up I'm just going to put this bearing back in. Next up we're going to start assembling our gear, our main camshafts. So there's three separate camshafts in these and they fit in each of these three bearings here, here and here one of which is driven by the motor, and the other two are, have their torque transferred to them via a bunch of spur gears. So I'm going to start with the one that is driven by the motor. This has got an extended shaft out the back, and this upgraded version has a D shaft on here. So what we're going to start with is a spacer. Um, I've got two different kinds of spacers actually, so these two bronze spacers, one of which is non-keyed and has a boss at the back, and the other spacer, which is more like a coin with a keyed shaft in the center. 
These are not to be confused with the bushings. These are very, very thin, whereas the bushings are eccentric and about three millimeters thick. So I'm gonna start with these boss but, uh, bushings and chuck one on the back here. And on this motor one, we wanna work from the motor shaft backwards. Then we can install a, sh a key just in front of it and push it up firmly against the back using that spacer. When we have two of these spacers on, it'll be clamping that key in the middle. Okay, next up on the stack, we're gonna be grabbing one of our spur gears and chucking it onto the key. These can be a quite tight fit. Just wanna make sure it really clicks into place. If it doesn't, don't use too much force, otherwise you are liable to get stuff stuck. There we go. Just like that. Followed by a spacer. On those coin spacers, so it's the keyed one. Make sure you're not using a bushing instead. And these can be quite tight and hard to align with the key. With the key. So you can see, it's not quite aligned. And there we go, you kind of rock it back and forth and it does clip on very snugly. Good, next up we're doing one of the bearings. Now, there are two separate kinds of, not bearings, bushings. So, there are two separate kinds of bushings. One of which has the key on top and one of which has the key on the bottom. So you can see a different amount of material on top of that key, uh, the keyway. These are two different types. There should be three of each kind. Just keep them separate through, during assembly so you know which ones you're using. So grab any of the one, two, uh, any of these two types. However, the first bushings that we lay down on these have to be kept consistent across all three shafts. So I'm gonna chuck this one down now. Like that, and you can see I'm using the low side one. So when I duplicate this process for the other two shafts, I'm going to be using the same bushing first. Cool. Now I'm gonna install that onto our gear. Now this motor driven one has to be put in a very specific spot because the motor is only driven from one of these bearing locations. So let's have a look on the back and see where our motor is located. So on this elbow joint, it's being driven from here. You can tell because there is a little semicircular cut here that is space for the coupler. It does exist on the other side, but obviously there is no motor shaft located there. Uh, you'll need to do the same thing on the other two joints, but it is more or less the same process. So I'm gonna insert that shaft, this motor shaft, through the bushing and line up the spur gear as I push it through. Just like that. When it's in, everything should snugly fit onto the shoulder of this shaft. And if we have a look on the back, it's now protruding through and there's plenty of shaft length in order for the motor coupler to put on. Now we're gonna put the motor coupler in right now so we can hold this shaft exactly where we want it. Just gonna zoom out a little bit for that. Okay, as you can see this bushing, uh, bearing, thrust bearing we put in earlier is now being clipped by this spur gear. So that's why I put it in first. So this is our motor coupler and it has different sets of holes. These are the legacy bobby pin holes. The two, uh, four, sorry, four two millimeter holes on either side. And then we've got the new grub screw holes right here. These are M4 grub screw holes. Just make sure that you get grub screws that are long enough that they can go through the entire thing and engage with enough aluminum to not strip out the aluminum. So if we put our coupler on, we wanna have a look at that D shaft. So D shaft is facing the camera right now. We want to make sure the grub screws are facing that D shaft, just like that. I'm gonna put the grub screws in this first just to make assembly a little bit easier. 
when we assemble this, we need to use Loctite on those grub screws, otherwise they will vibrate loose and you'll end up with a loose um, motor coupler. I'm just going to use some blue Loctite. Just a generous drip onto that grub screw. Don't have to do it evenly because it'll spread out when you install it. So these M4 grub screws have a H2 Allen key. That's one. Focus. Just like that. You can see there's a fair bit of Loctite that is welled out of those threads. We can clean that off right now because all the Loctite we need is on the threads themselves. Okay, now when we install this shaft, again, make sure it aligns to the flat side of that D shaft. And you might have put those grub screws in a little bit too far, so just back them off until they, the shaft can freely slide on. I'm just going to tighten those on using the long arm. Snug them both up first, and then use the short arm. And be really careful when doing this because grub screws have a very small hex size on them for the size of the bolt. And just tweak those nice and tight. If you go too tight, you will strip the Allen key or the grub screw, which is bad news. Just about that. That's good. And Loctite is going to hold those tight. Great. Now that coupler should not fall off and you can now rotate it as needed. At this point, this particular keyway shape has been duplicated by this 3D printed tool I made, which is the exact size as the motor shaft. So you can insert there and get a little bit more torque on that thing if you ever need to, so you can rotate those gears. Yeah, it's just occurred to me that I forgot to grease up this lower thrust bearing. So I'm just going to pause this video and I get back to you when I've already, uh, when I'm ready to put some grease into this bearing. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is applying some lithium molybdenum disulfide grease onto our parts. So in particular these thrust, um, axial thrust bearings need to be filled with grease. So whenever sand gets into the gearbox, this is the first thing they're going to find. So we need some thick grease in there that will be pushed out and grab any of the sand particles or anything that actually is going to get in here. As well as lubricating obviously these needles so that when they do roll they're not worn down. Not as much. So the way to um, grease these is you find the side that has the single ditch that runs all the way around and we're going to be basically filling that ditch with a bunch of grease. So the way I like to do this basically squeeze it like a thing of toothpaste. I'm running out here, so squeeze it through from the back. By far uses the most grease in here. Basically just rub while squeezing and get an even coverage across all of those needle bearings. And this will be stored in that ditch, so you don't have to make sure it's super even, as long as each roller has a supply of some grease. So I should obviously strongly recommend using some natural gloves for this, because otherwise you'll be very, very greasy by the end of it. Cool. Just like that, and then we can chuck the bearings on, and because these are greased up, all, these, the, all the grease will start coming through. And grease is going to hold these together as well. Cool. 
cool, just like that. All right, I'll get back to you when I put the couple back on. Okay, we're back. So we've put the couple back on, and we're back to where we were before with grease this time. Gonna continue applying um, grease as we assemble all these things. What we're gonna do first is put all three of these shafts in, camshafts in, so that when we apply grease to these spur gears, um, they can be nicely distributed by the gear action themselves. So, exactly the same thing what we did for this camshaft here. I'm going to take one of the non-motor driven ones, which is exactly the same, except it's completely symmetrical without missing a, a D-shaft on one of them. And we're putting the same stack of parts on this as we did for this one. So, I'm going to run through that again with the spacer, followed by key. It's nice to put the key in after the spacer, so you can use a spacer to really squash it up against that little fillet at the end of the slot um, to keep it in place. Spogia, flat spacer. I'll zoom in for the next one. For the entirety of the next one. Spacer, followed by the same bushing that we used before. So before we used a low side spacer with a very, very small amount of material above the key. Now I'm using the same one. So this is very important, it has to be the same one, otherwise the disc, the cycloidal discs, these things, will not go on. There we go. And as we insert this, we need to make sure that the keys align. So these spur gears have been chosen very specifically to have a divisible number of teeth on each. So I'm just gonna zoom in for this. You can see that this keyway here is facing up, and when we install any other one, I'm just going to install an arbitrary spot here. See that the keyways are going to rotate relative, um, yeah, with each other. Now, importantly, we need to keep these eccentric bushings with this eccentricity on the same side of the shaft so that the disc can move with all three. So, we have to make sure that when we put our second and third shafts in, that the location of the keyway is matched exactly to these. Well, I say exactly, almost exactly. The position of the keys on the spur gears that we have, at least the default ones we have, um, we've got machined externally, do not match the position of the key, or the keyway, relative to the teeth. So unfortunately, they'll always be a little bit off. So that looks like it's a little bit too far counterclockwise from the previous one. I'm just gonna lift the whole thing out, rotate it by, one tooth and put it back in and see how that looks. There we go. And that's looking pretty good, I think. Hard to tell. Right, let me zoom out a little bit. Yeah. So now those keyways will always be aligned. So as long as the teeth don't strip out, these will always have the eccentricity on the same side of the gear housing. Great. Let's move on to the next one. I'm gonna start zooming in for this, as far as I can go. So, shaft, spacer, key. Key, followed by spur gear. Followed by flat spacer. And followed by the same bushing type that we've used for the past two shafts. So again, this is the low side key. Just like that. And again, when we install this, we need to make certain that all three shafts have the key on the same side. It's done visually. And there we go. out a little bit. And you can see all three keys are rotating at the same speed and the keys will be locked to each other. A 
Okay, now that we've gotten all three shafts installed and all of the spur gears are matching, just do a quick vertical alignment. If we put this sun gear on the incorrect side, it will be very misaligned. It'll have like a one millimeter gap on one of the sides of the spur gears. But the top of the sun gear should be the same level as the top of the planetary or spur gears on around them. Next up, we're going to be applying some grease to these. So there needs to be grease on every single contact surface. There are unfortunately quite a few wearing components in this gearbox, so we need to make sure that they are bathed in grease. You probably can might be able to hear it. There's a little bit of a high spot on some of the gears. This has been a bit of a problem with these gears as soon as we bought them. We might remachine these soon, um, which is that they're not fully concentric, which means that they have more engagement on one side than the other. Not a huge issue, but it can add to friction in the gearbox. Okay, um, the way that I apply lithium grease to these gears is I just squirt a bit out on your finger, again, just like toothpaste. Like this. And I want to kind of put it amongst the teeth of the gear. I'll just zoom in. You can do this anyway, really, but this is pretty fun. Chuck it in there, and just like toothpaste, but for gear teeth, um, it'll be eaten up by the gears. Don't eat toothpaste. And you want to make sure that there is enough grease on all of those teeth. I normally go about that amount, but three times sometimes. It's probably a bit excessive, but oh well. And make sure you get coating on both sides of the involute by rotating backwards. And any globs that are kind of hanging on, just push them back into the teeth. Great. Okay, next up, we've got another wear contact on these bushings. So, all of these eccentric bushings will be wearing consider a considerable amount. Zoom out just a little bit. On the edges of these bushings, they'll be wearing against the inside of these um, cycloidal discs continuously. So, I'm going to want to apply enough grease to those surfaces. More is better here because it will eat through this grease when it's loaded up. And kind of squeeze it out of there so you only want to fill up the whole area around it so it doesn't continue to pull air or, worst case, sand into the surfaces because that will destroy it almost immediately. Don't be worried if you get grease over all the shafts and everything, everything else can be covered in grease if you want. Just going to make more of a mess. fingerprint painting over here. Great. Okay, next up we're putting our cycloidal discs in. Now these are very, very important. Um, this profile on the outside engages with the teeth on, on our cycloidal ring over here. Um, by moving eccentrically, they move one across at a time, and these are critical wear surfaces across here. This bumpy surface on the outside, I call them the disc loads, and this inside here which is bearing on these bronze bearings, uh, bushings. So, another important thing about these cycloidal discs are there are matched pairs that have to go together. So there's two separate geometries you need to worry about. So type two, which, look on this one, see two little scratch marks there, and also on the other side, there's another two scratch marks just next to it. This is a type two disc, and on this one here, Get the light correct. This is a type 1 disc. Same thing on the other side. Same indicator. 1s and 2s have to be matched per gearbox. You can use a 1 and a 2 from any gearbox, I suppose, but just keep them together, and you'll only be able to put these two in at the same time. Um, you won't be able to put two 2s in, otherwise the ring won't fit on. And importantly, you have to make sure that when you put these on, the indicated hole, which is the top two here, are on the same camshaft. Same camshaft. 
So I'm going to start with, oh, I'll start with number one, I suppose. And let's chuck it on here. I'm going to keep the number up here, closest um, kind of zoom out a little bit further in between where the second linkage is going to slot in, just so I know that this side is where I want the indicator. I'm going to slot that in there, just like that. And if you want to, you can now grab a little driver key, chuck it in the coupler, and watch that disc move eccentrically. Doesn't move much. Literally three millimeters. Actually, less than that, I think. But it's enough to make those lobes engage and disengage at a time with that ring. And you might be able to hear that grease is kind of being pumped around and moved through. So next up, I'm going to put some more grease on top of these because. The top and bottom of these discs are wearing on top of bronze bushings on this camshaft. Most of the load is through those bushing, the bushing faces, but there's definitely some axial load that does occur. So I'm going to make sure that there's plenty of grease on top and bottom. And there's little chamfers as well around the edge of the um, the hole on the aluminium um, cycloidal disc, which is good at holding this grease. It relaxes a little reservoir. like that. Next up we're going to be putting more flat spaces in. So not bushings, flat spaces. These spaces are going to separate the two discs apart from each other so that they don't rub on each other. So when we put these on they're going to squash a lot of that grease out of the way. That's totally fine. Um, can be a little bit hard to see the keys now. You might want to move a little bit of grease out of the way so you can spot them. Once you know the location of one of the keys of course you'll know the location of all three. So squeeze that on, you can see all the grease is kind of welled out of there when I push that in. And do the same thing for all three. I know that the key is somewhere on this side. Oh, I got it first time. There you go. And I can see this third one. There you go. Okay, next up we're going to be putting the separate bushings on. So this disc number one is using all of the low side keyway bushings. Disc number two on top is going to be using the other offset so that these two discs are moving out of phase with each other. They're exactly opposite sides of the cycloidal, uh, well, the procession, I suppose. So yeah, um, these are the, low, uh, the high side keyway. So we've got more material above that keyway than compared to the other ones. And we're going to be slotting these on, one per camshaft. These can be a little bit tight because that keyway is extra tight compared to some of the spaces. Now that we can't see the keyway, it can be a bit annoying. There we go, got it. And you can probably, I'm not sure if you can see, but the keys are not protruding past these bushings. That's where the key stops. That's where all the parts, important parts of these actually exist. Okay, let's do more grease again on these bushings. Exactly the same as ones below. You can use some of the existing grease if you need. Just to smear it around that spacer and onto these bushing surfaces. bronze in order to ideally avoid excessive wear on the aluminium surfaces. It's a little bit softer than steel, significantly softer than steel, but also a bit harder than aluminium. Ideally we'd be using harder materials for the cycloidal bushing, cycloidal discs, because they're more expensive to machine, um, but in this case they'd be too heavy. So we have to use aluminium discs and bronze bushings. Eventually we'll have to replace those discs, probably before we have to replace the bushings, which is unfortunate. Okay, now that all three of those um, high side bushings are greased up, we're going to be putting on our next disc. Important to note is the location of our scratch marks here. So you can see the number two there, that does not exist on any of the other holes. It's only this hole here. 
then it has to align on top of the hole on the first disc which we know is right here if you uh, didn't make note of it earlier it might be a little bit difficult to see because it's now covered in grease but you can always just move out of the way and there it is right there you see a very faint number one on that disc so i'm just going to slot this one over the top now and that should slide straight on if you have managed to use the wrong bushings at any point, these discs won't slide on. The distance between the holes, will, uh, between the center of the, each of those bushings is different if you use the wrong ones or the keyways aren't aligned. So everything will slot together, doesn't need any force. It should just slide on. Cool, and next up, we're putting more grease on top of all of these before putting our very last spaces on. There we go. Now we should have three more of these boss spaces. So spaces with a boss on it, no keyway. And they're gonna slide straight on over the top of that puddle of grease, just like that. And that. And that. And that concludes our camshaft assembly. All three are now assembled. Um, have everything on there. All of our nice golden shiny bronze bits are covered in grease. Or very soon to be. Um, and yeah, what we're going to do now is probably check the fit, make sure everything is still able to rotate. So a couple ways we can do this, you can chuck a motor on the backside and do that, or you can just grab a tool, or please don't use pliers to grip a couple of things made of aluminium and very delicate. Some of them are already a bit marred from a, a pair of pliers, so I'm just going to chuck that couple of this on the back, and I'm going to give it a rotate. And we'll make sure that all both of those discs are able to move nice and freely. There's very little resistance. I can feel in that coupler, especially when you drive it by hand, um, the resistance at the the spur gears were having a little bit of a meshing problem. I can feel that through this entire assembly, but that's a, only a tiny, tiny amount of resistance. These are otherwise spinning very freely. So that feels good. Once you're sure that it is able to rotate, Actually, if, you, if it doesn't rotate, then try disassembling half of it. Make sure your shafts spin when you've just got the spur gears on. Try it again when you've just got the first disc on. And then finally put the last disc back on and see if it all assembles. It's important to continuously check as you're assembling to make sure it all goes together properly. Okay, next up, we are going to be putting... our cycloidal ring on. Now before we do this we have to prepare it with grease and prepare the disc lobes with more grease. So most important wear surface on this entire gearbox is the interface between those discs and the ring. So grab a nice dollop of grease and try to smear it evenly across the edges of those two discs. like this. And make sure it's got a nice even coating and we'll be doing the same thing on the ring so it's not super important that you have a, an overwhelming amount here because the ring is a lot better at hauling grease. So each of these raised sections is going to be continuously engaged with some part of the, these discs. Now, similar to the thrust bearings, we can kind of apply it just by rubbing it along. I'm running really low on lithium grease, unfortunately. I'll try to squeeze out a bit more. across that entire surface and it will continuously push its way out of the ring just grab it and keep putting it on the inside it takes a bit to work the grease into the gaps between these the gaps between these raised pins they're called pins at least in a, in a conventional gearbox because they're actually freely float uh, freely floating rather than fixed to this ring but this one's 
the cheaper, lighter version. Um, yeah, they kind of hold grease between them, which is good. All the any debris that does get caught in this gearbox will be pushed into those little gullets and save our teeth. I hope that doesn't happen. I've never had it happen. And again, just make sure there's a nice coating on all of those teeth. Okay, good. Next up, we want to make sure that the race, the locating race on the inside here, has a nice even coverage of grease that's going to be locating it in this gear housing. Alright, so just applying some bearing grease to the locating race of this cycloidal ring. It's easiest to rub it here. You can rub it on the inside here as well, but you need kind of a small finger to do that. A lot of this grease does get pushed out as soon as you start actually moving the gearbox. But you need to make sure there's a good coverage across the entire thing. So this whole race here is now coated in grease. Okay, time of truth. If you've aligned both of these discs in properly and all those shafts, this should just slide on. Sometimes a little satisfying click noise if you don't have a lot of grease, but I'm thinking that grease is bringing damp in that sound. So when you push it in, you gotta make sure that these all align up. Just like that. Okay, no satisfying click unfortunately, but it's very firmly in. You can see from the edges here, there's only a very small and even gap across the entire perimeter. Great, you can again plug in this little coupler here and make sure that everything is seated properly. And you will notice for the first time that this cycloda ring is rotating around the entire thing. That is the main mechanism by which this gearbox works. If you do this too much, you'll find that the ring will probably pop out towards you. Um, so you got to kind of hold it down. The next thing will be securing the locking ring on top. So we're getting to that in a sec. Yep, just worth noting that that is now freely rotating and working quite nicely. Let's remove that key again. Okay, so next up we're going to be installing the second of our Axial bearings, or thrust, thrust bearings. Again, there are three parts to this one. The lower, the inner, and the upper. We wanna cram this thing with a bunch of grease again. Hopefully I've got enough here. Really like practicing some uh, toothpaste origami here. Be able to get as much in this one as I did the previous one. Damn it. Okay. Generally, you will load up that entire ditch with grease. groove in the center with grease. I do not have enough for this assembly, which is a little bit annoying. Um, don't do what I do. Wait, sort of. Do what I say, not what I do. Oh, yeah, there's plenty in here. Just got to fold it right. All right. There we go. Ok, 
Okay, that is good now. So again, chuck on lower and the upper race. Doesn't matter which is which or which way you put that into the gearbox, but that's going to go in and fit nicely. Sometimes there's a bit of a burr on that inner race. Just whoop. And there also can be a little bit oval shaped just because they were pretty cheap. <laughs> um, compared to the official SKF ones. These were probably just ones that didn't pass their QA. So if it doesn't fit, if it doesn't, if it goes in, but doesn't rotate freely, it might be worth pulling it out quickly, rotating it just a tad, and putting it back in. Doesn't matter too much once this whole thing is assembled, but it's worth getting aligned nicely. Sometimes these really get greased in and stuck with grease, so. Oh man, it's really stuck in. Oop, I'm pulling the ring out while I do that. Make sure that lower race goes in. Yep, that's nice. This one's a little bit sharp. That's going to do the job. That should be fine. While the, the actual cage of those bearings is stuck in place, all the individual needle roller bearings are able to move. Okay, next up we're going to be putting this little aluminium spacer in. So it's much thinner than the actual races, but it has the same outer diameter. This is so that when we put on the locking plate, which is this thing here, oop, not the way around, the bearing flanges don't actually contact this. Okay, sorry for cutting out, my camera apparently keeps overheating. Okay, as I was saying, this spacer fits around the bearing flanges on this side. Uh, these are flanged bearings, so we gotta make sure that they go around and don't contact this upper race. If they're contacting the upper race, it means it's going to be squashing against the thrust bearing in three specific spots and not across the entire thing. So that just adds a little bit of a spacer on top of these bearing flanges. Cool. So I'm going to chuck that in now. And next thing we're going to do is chuck in the locking plate. So this is kind of the last time you'll be looking at this whole surface. Um, what I'd lastly recommend doing is grabbing a little bit of grease and putting it on the inside. squeeze the life out of your tube. There we go. Last tiny bit, and I'm going to put it on the inside of this face of the cycloidal ring. Let's pull out that spacer while I do this. Oh, I'll leave it in there. Yeah, it's fine. And that's just because this locking ring can contact this. It really shouldn't, but it does. And we can create a little wear surface on the inside here. You don't need much grease there, just enough to coat the surface. And we're going to put our locking ring in. Now this has got two sides, I shouldn't need to specify that. Um, one of which has a flange on the bearing and the other one does not. And this side also has countersinks, so obviously we want the countersinks for our countersunk bolts. If it's on the inside of the gearbox, don't go out of fastener, so keep the countersinks on the outside of the gearbox. And chuck it in like so. It doesn't matter what orientation you put this in, as long as it lines up with all three shafts, that's good. Okay, last thing we need to do is bolt this entire thing together, basically bolting this locking plate onto the back of the gear housing. I'm gonna quickly wipe my hands because I'm gonna wipe the whole thing down with a rag now actually, because otherwise it's gonna be a bit tricky to handle. Small Allen keys and grease, greasy hands. Not a great mix. You can use a little bit of degreaser on your rag. And just gonna clean it up a lot better. This stuff's amazing. Now that all the grease is safely locked inside, we shouldn't need to touch it again. I'd keep the gloves on for the meantime, but... Just want it so that we can hold the thing without slipping out of our hands. Okay, there we go. 
nice and shiny. We've got six of these axial locking bolts. These are pretty much the entire, uh, what holds the entire gearbox together. Everything else kind of slots into each other. Put the countersink through on one side. Grab a H2.5 Allen key. And put a washer and a nylock nut. Zoom in while I do this. Washer and nylock nut on the back side of each of these. So it's protruding through the back. This can be a little bit hard to align sometimes. Um, you kind of have to wiggle it around about and make sure that it actually protrudes out the back of the gear housing. And we want to do pretty much all six of these finger tight. So as soon as it starts to rotate on your finger, stop there and move to the next one. The camera's about to overheat, so I'm going to put all six of these in, just loosely, and I'll get back to you. Okay, I've got all six of those installed. And all of them are extremely, extremely loose. They're really only just sitting there. Next thing to do is tighten them just to the point where this locking plate can't come out any further. So if you have a look at how much of a gap there is between the back face of this washer and the actual nylock, it's about a millimeter or so um, across every single one of these. We're gonna take that millimeter out and then stop there. We don't wanna clamp that locking plate until we've got this thing rotating and we can kind of tweak them into place. So I'm gonna grab a seven millimeter spanner. Um, you can actually, in fact, I might, because this one's so open, I might use a little spanner set instead, a uh, socket set. And just tighten all of these until there is no force, so you'll feel it when it sort of torques in, but so that there is just enough force to hold that locking plate in. No more. We don't want to lock it up yet because if you go down too tight it will stop rotating and lock up the entire thing. And this is just a starting point for how much torque they will eventually need. So if you feel any resistance between the Allen key and this, so when you rotate the nut or the Allen key, vice versa, and you feel it transferring torque into your other hand, it means you're tightening and you need to loosen off. Actually, that's not true because he's an eye lock, so you'll always feel that. Go and tighten until it starts increasing. Just keep looking for that air gap between the washer and the nylock nut. You should be able to rotate it like this and feel next to no resistance. I've actually done that one up a little bit too tightly. Yeah, this one off half quarter of a turn and it's perfect. There we go. So just make sure that all of these are the same. You should just be able to freely rotate this by swiveling the Allen key like this. They are all That one's too tight. There we go. That one's also a little bit too tight. Okay, all these are good to go. Now what we're gonna do is install the motor interface plate, the motor, and then hook it up to the power supply so that we can rotate it while we adjust these bolts further. So next up we're going to need the motor interface plate, our Maxon motor, and four very short countersunk bolts. These are M4 countersunk bolt bolts, so we'll need the same Allen key we're using for these axial bolts here. And I'm going to Chuck one through. 
line it up with the hole on the motor and push the motor through until the boss on the outside here, this little lip, uh, this lip, the first lip on the inside of the motor, is pushed through that hole, the big hole in the center, while aligning that screw. Just like that. Whoop, like that. And caution, putting any weight on the encoder cable at the back of these motors, it's very fragile. You will be murdered if you damage them. Uh, yep. <laughs> so now that those are good and tight. In fact, don't tighten them up. You want to install all four before tightening them. So finger, finger tight all of them. And then we want to go in a star pattern and tighten all four. I'm going into steel here so you don't have to be... You can give it a bit more torque than you normally would, but it's going to a very expensive motor, so be careful. There we go. Okay, next up, we need to use this tiny key. So, these Maxon motors have a keyway that's the precise length of this key. Don't lose this key, otherwise it'll be really annoying to replace. Because you gotta round off the corners and shit if you want to make another one. That will be inserted in there, and then immediately put into this coupler. Because that's gonna fall out pretty quickly. You can use a drop of Loctite in there if you want to keep it in. Uh, but I find that Loctite in this particular case tends to fall out really quickly. And doesn't last long at all. I'd prefer just to be conscious of these things falling out whenever you rip the motor out of there. I need to go and clear some memory off my camera or something. I'll be right back with you. Alright, welcome back for one hour and eight minutes of recording time. Okay, so... We're just talking about the motor keyway. Make sure that it is properly squished in. Sometimes the old Loctite can make it bunch up and not sit flush. And when we install this, it's probably best to grab your little tool at this point. First of all, check that makes sure the entire gearbox is still rotating, which when I rotate this, the top of the gear box is rotating, which is a good sign. And what I'm gonna do is figure out where that's pointing to roughly, relative to the gearbox, which is that on that side about there so when I put that in it'll pretty much slide straight in you can of course just hmm, what you do this put it in at an angle like this if it's an easier position to have the motor interface and check that the key is sliding straight in and not squashed off to one side that's a bit of a tight fit to push it in there now you probably noticed that I've pushed this in so that I can't literally slide it past that. That's okay because this is aluminium and it's flexible, so I'm just going to push that up. Push this up and rotate the whole thing around. There we go. And we want to align the motor plate with these four bolt holes here. These four bolt holes just use M4 cap head screws. So I grab an H3 Allen key. And track them through. These can be a little bit difficult to align, so just get the first one threaded in and stop. Go for the next one, go across to the diagonal corner and chuck it in here. Thread it in just. Go for the next one, and the reason we're not tightening them yet is because it'll make the other ones very difficult to align. So I want to get all the threads just established and then move on to the next one now that all four are in I want to continue tightening make them all finger tight go in a star pattern if you can so diagonal diagonal yeah. across any structural component where you're doing this make sure you do it in a star pattern we'll be doing this on the locking plate shortly once they're all loosely tight Grab the short arm of the Allen key 
and you want to tighten those up nice and snug. We don't have to lock tight these in because we will be removing these for installing resolvers and cables and all sorts of things. I tend to find that these come off semi often. Oop. This one was not very tight. Let's keep going with the short arm. There we go. But these four screws hold the entire motor concentric to everything, so they need to be pretty tight before we turn the motor on. Otherwise, the whole motor will tend to wibble, uh, wiggle around. Just because it's through so many components, you can't maintain concentricity through like three separate parts. The bearings take care of it, don't worry. Congrats, you now have a gearbox. So, this is still quite loose. If you grab the locking ring and push it against the central bore, I might zoom in for this so you can actually have a chance of seeing it. If you grab here and here and pull. Oop. Nope, it's not going to do it because you're watching. Um, sometimes you can notice that if you pull on this, the locking plate will flex just enough so you can see that gap opening a bit wider. As it is, it's quite wide. I can kind of push it closed even which means that our axial bolts are not nearly tight enough. Okay, but what we're going to do first is we're going to plug it in. So, grab the motor twitch kit or a couple of alligator leads and hook it up to this Molex cable. I'm going to just uh, cut the camera now and I'll get back to you once it's all set up. All right, welcome back. Don't ask what happened to the Twitch kit. Um, I'm just gonna use some alligator clips and chuck that on. Uh, it's not gonna fall apart really quick, so if this motor turns off, that's the reason. You can see the shaft is turning nice and quickly, and the output is rotating as well. I'm gonna bump up the power, or the voltage, to 30 volts. And what you really want to do is check that it is moving nice and evenly. It's not making crunching noises or anything. And also, check the current flowing through to the motor. So we're currently at 800, 700 milliamp hours, milliamps, which is pretty low. Um, still a fair bit of improvement to go on that, but it's a good amount for this kind of gearbox. We don't really care about efficiency, we just care about torque. Alright, so while that is rotating, what we're going to be doing... Now that the motor face is on, I'm going to start using a spanner instead. So, while avoiding that very quickly rotating motor coupler, don't stick a finger in there, it'll probably pull it off. Um, the finger, I mean, not the coupler. Um, we're going to be tightening these up one at a time in a star-like pattern. So, give that a rotation, feel the amount of torque that I need to actually rotate that without having a spanner on the back, and go over to the other side. Right in there. Grab the nut, and rotate it by it was about half a turn or so, and check that that still feels okay. That's good. And move up across to this one. Yeah, this one here. Um, you have to flip the motor around to get to that one. So just be careful while doing this. So nothing gets into there. And there goes my alligator clips. Whee! <laughs> so 30 volts a deer. I had a coupler here to help drive this before, and that's all I'm missing. I'm gonna probably grab something to push that up off of the table. It says when it's driving, it's not actually rolling off the table. a lot more 
more fiddly than I was hoping. Man, press is fast. Gonna adjust this one here. So. Rotate that out half a turn. Yeah, that's our man talk. And then we go to this one here. That one seems a bit looser than the other ones. I'm gonna go about a full turn for that one. And as you're tightening this, just keep an eye on the current that the power supply is measuring. Make sure that you're not clamping anything down. You'll hear that audibly change if you've done something like that. If you clamp down too far and it'll load up well beyond 100 million. Find that as you tighten some bolts, others will loosen. So you want to kind of go in a circle, I'm avoiding clipping it because it's going to take ages to turn back on again. Let's just do that. Stay, stay. All right, good. about done and our current is still at 700 milliamps if you've assembled something wrong this locking plate will clamp down on the actual camshaft itself rather than the axial thrust bearings instead so at this point you'll know if you've assembled it correctly or not just checking all the torque and all these screws as it's a good indication of how much force is actually being put on each side of this. That one seems a bit loose again. I'm going to tighten that one a little bit. And that's better. Good. All right. That's it. I would also recommend trying the opposite direction for the gearbox. Sometimes it'll run a little bit differently backwards. Same. Check the current. About 800 milliamp hours, not milliamps. Down to 700. Sometimes, as you continue to run in one direction, it'll ease up a lot. Okay, and that's it. That concludes the assembly of a cycloidal gearbox. Just run some uh, rag on the outside, a little bit of degreaser, finally, to make it nice and shiny. Thank you for watching, see you later.